extra pack or you want the sachet that you can mix with hot water when you're on the go, then they have all those options for you. And it has all the vitamins, all the nutrients, and of course, a lot of cocoa, original Ghanaian cocoa. They also have niche chocolate that comes in a uh, variety. So whether you like the strawberry, the coconuts, the milk, dark chocolate, you have all of that in this pack that is being displayed here. So go ahead and enjoy niche chocolate. Niche taste of Ghana. Time to introduce my guest this morning. We have lawyer Joyce Bar Mukhtari and she is a special aide to former President John Dramani Mohammed, a former Deputy Transport Minister here on behalf of the NDC. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you in your red and black. I, I think I'm like... the only one who didn't get the memo because my other guest is also in all red today, spotting a few colors representing her party, but very dominant is the red color. Ellen Amadeko is here. Hi, and uh, yes, yeah, she is a member of the NPP communications team. And in actual fact, on Saturday, she was also on the ballot paper, hoping to emerge winner uh, and represent the women as a national women's organizer. Good morning. Hiya. How are you doing? I'm exhausted. I can but, imagine. But uh, for God and country. For God so and I'm country. Here. It didn't go as you expected. Oh, no, it didn't. Were you optimistic that you win, though? Oh, yes. Why would you want to go into an election without wanting to win? Okay. I wanted, truly wanted to win because I, I believe I, I have a lot I wanted to do. Mm. But when you're going against the system, a lot of things go on. So, when you say system, what do you mean by that? Well, I went against two incumbents. Okay. So that should tell you the sort of battle I was engaged in. But I'm happy I went. Mm. At least I've, I've put myself out there. There's a lot more years ahead. Mm. I was the youngest. I am the youngest of the lot. Oh, okay. So the next four years, mm. God willing, mm. if we are alive, I'll be back again. But the reason I actually feel optimistic was the fact that all the regional national women's organizers, they were there to pick the form and file for uh, Madame Kate Jimfa, who's the incumbent and has retained her position. Mm -hmm. Which is why I was asking you, because if all those women were supporting her, did it also mean that naturally they'll also galvanize the grassroots and the well, delegates yes, to vote it's, for it's, her? it's possible. And remember, she's been in the system for almost 12 years. Mm. She was a deputy to Honorable Utiku, Utiku Afisha yeah. Jabba before mm. she became the women's organizer. Mm. And so... Uh, she knows the system. Mm. Uh, but then the point is some of us would also have to get in because eventually they will leave and yeah. some of us need to show up. So we'll see you again. Oh, yes, definitely. The next time definitely. national elections will be held for the MPP. Yeah. I see. Anyway, we're expecting a third guest. We hope that she'll be able to join us shortly. And when she does, we will introduce her. But let's get straight into our conversation for today. And the big one that everybody's talking about and it's had everyone asking if they are corrupt or not, is that report that has been put out um, by the Ghana Statistical Service and the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice, and of course the Ghana Integrity as well. It says that the first ever integrity, uh, Ghana Inte Integrity of Public Services Survey has been launched in Accra. And the survey as presented by the government statistician, Professor Samuel Kobina Enim, is centered on bribery activities in public sectors in 2021. And an estimated amount of 5 billion Ghana cities representing 26.7% was paid as bribes in 2021. And in actual fact, institutions that topped the list of most corrupt, uh, we had the Ghana Police Service at number one, uh, the Ghana Immigration Service and the Ghana Revenue Authority. Let's quickly take a look at a story um, that was put together on this. And when we get back, we'll start the conversation. The report, which targeted 15,000 households, revealed that more than eight out of 10 adults in Ghana had at least one contact with a public official in 2021, representing 83.8%. 26.7% of people who have had contact with public officials paid them bribes. For bribe payers, the average number of bribes they paid was five times in 2021, meaning more than 17.4 million bribes were paid in 2021, showing the levels of administrative corruption in the country. The survey further revealed that younger people are more likely to pay bribes than the older people. The prevalence of bribery decreases steadily to 17.6% among those aged 65 and over. Also, Ghanaians with a master's degree and or a bachelor's degree are much more likely to have been asked to pay a bribe than those with no formal education. 
on who takes the most bribes, the survey results indicate that the prevalence of bribery in relation to police officers is considerably higher than in relation to any other type of public official in Ghana. Teachers, lecturers and professors, as well as doctors, midwives and nurses were all listed. Interesting report, and that's why we're asking you this question. We'd like you to answer uh, very honestly, are you corrupt or not? Or are you also going to give us reasons as to why uh, corruption needs to be defined properly so you know where to situate yourself? But let me start off with lawyer Joyce Bar Mukhtari. I don't think it's surprising, especially because if you look at the uh, details that have been given, it clearly states that the Ghana Police Service is the most corrupt out of the number of public institutions that were listed. And so um, out of 15,000 households, it says that 53.2% of them said the Ghana Police Service was the most corrupt, followed by the Ghana Immigration Service with 37 Point four percent. Any surprises here, knowing also that there had been a 2019 Afrobarometer report that clearly stated that, you know, out of the 2,400 people that voted or that had their opinion solicited, about 57% of them said that the Ghana Police Service was the most corrupt. Well, a very good morning to you, Bella. Good morning, Emma, and uh, everybody else. And uh, I mean, I don't even know where to start from. And uh, <laughs> Maybe let me start from quoting from the Honorable A.B. Fuseni, one of his very interesting proverbs, which actually posits that if your mother dies in the marketplace mm. and then you pretend that you don't know she's dead, everybody will hear about the death because this is a very public place mm. and this is where they found the corpse of the mother. So you will need no further announcement because it happened in a very public place. Mm. Um, Bella, certainly a conversation that each and every citizen of Ghana has actually been engaged in for quite some time, that this country is currently embroiled in corruption of all kinds, foibles of same corruption, perception is at an, an all-time high, acts of corruption prevalent above all even at the seat of government at leadership level the highest level mm. there is this extreme perception that largely the inertia of uh, the akufa dobamia's inability to literally tackle corruption is born out of the fact that even at the seat of government there is a high perception of corruption and prevalence of sin. We had the Imani report, if you remember. Mm -hmm. We had the Afrobarometer report. We had Parliament itself demanding accountability from government regarding COVID resources, huge sums of money that had actually been expended. We also had many other individuals from the CDD from the Ghana Integrity Initiative. And of course, this final one, where we have a government agency, no mean an agency, but the government statistical service itself, participating in collaboration with the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, one of Ghana's foremost anti-corruption agencies to undertake the survey. And what the survey actually delivers it's actually no surprise. What it does basically, it, it literally cements, it seals this huge corruption and greed that literally has engulfed this country. And you see, it permeates all levels, especially in the public service. And I'm sure you can tell that it starts, funny enough, with the uniformed uh, sectors where you'd probably expect, even if for nothing at all, a certain circumspection, or at least a modicum of a, a more reduced perception of uh, this prevalent acts of corruption. But unfortunately, they are not spared. With the police, for example, I recall that years ago, when similar conversations were taking place, the impression was that it's because they are also your first point of call in terms of 
citizen engagement. So you are either going to be coming into contact with a policeman or you're going to be coming into contact with a doctor or a nurse because these are the most common social encounter areas where citizens will come across persons within uh, a certain formal bracket. So yes, that may also contribute largely to this endemic perception about perceived uh, corruption, especially within the uh, police services. But funny enough, when I saw this report, I had a conversation even with another person from another uh, branch of the uh, security services. And then, I mean, her point was that, look, it is even worse even in the military. It is also prevalent even in the Navy. And uh, I'm sure the immigration service was mentioned as well. So yeah. think about it. What are the services that these particular bodies render? Mm -hmm. In any case, it also mentions the, um, the category of persons who are most likely willing mm -hmm. to pay for these bribes. Yeah. I love the fact that it does a certain regional analysis too. And the fact that our poorest parts mm -hmm. of the 16 regions are also less likely yeah. to be subs, you know, excessive to corruption, etc. So it actually, it literally brings to a certain conclusion. It summarizes for all of us what everybody has been talking about. I mean, you have a government that has a huge government machinery. Look, large governments breed enormous bureaucracy. They also breed deeper corruption. Mm. And what it means is that when you have so many aficionados, literally littered everywhere, it just means that there's more bureaucracy and there's enormous red tape. Mm. What do you do to go through the red tape is that you would actually cut through it. And how do you cut through it? You will actually pay your way through. You will find one friend or the other who is closely associated with somebody mm. or related to another person. And basically, the whole idea really is that talking about corruption and that latest study that has been put out by the Ghana Statistical Service. I was just quickly fixing something, but yes, carry on. So the Lawyer. whole idea really is that it is actually, literally, it is almost like a pandemic. The whole country is flooded mm. with either acts of it, perception of it, or occurrences of it. Look, we have the anti-corruption agencies, we have many legislations, including the Financial Management Act, mm. the Financial Reporting Act, the Commission on Human Rights Act, name it, mm -hmm. the Public Procurement Authority Act. Many of these attempts by the state in its own formal capacity to literally do what? Stem corruption. Mm. But the state itself and key actors are the first, literally, to find themselves in breach of all of these legislations that are literally put in place to aid the fight against corruption. Mm. In any case, when you find that at a time when large governments are perceived across the world to breed corruption, but you find a government that incubates this sort of government, bursting at the seams with many appointees, I've heard many experts who have called on government to cut down the size of its appointees and that government ministers should be reduced to at least 19. I've also heard about the Office of Government Machinery itself and calls that it should actually be trimmed down, basically. I've also heard about the numbers of persons who are currently, and I listened to uh, recently, someone who actually spoke about protocols that were being granted public officials to get people to enter the uh, uniform uh, services, etc. So it, it actually, look, even for school entry uh, processes into the universities, into the senior high schools, name it. And you see the report even speaks about services yeah. where you actually need to acquire a service, where you need to acquire a driver's license, where you need a police report. You know, everything that is required under your civic responsibilities to be given to you, you would have to find a way to grease the palms of somebody, to find a way to, you know, literally cut through the red tape, mm -hmm. you'll find a way to uh, navigate the bureaucracy, and above all, even the private sector is not spared, but at least there's something very noticeable 
about what happens in the private sector in particular, mm. and that it is actually under 30% because largely most private sector operators are actually profit oriented. Mm. So they will certainly be looking more at even preventing corruption because if you're a private sector person, for example, and the type of corruption that permeates government actually enters your private sector business, you know that is the end of it. But you see, I think that first and foremost, we ought to start to call on governments. We need to call on President Akufuado to do more. What, what more fight. exactly do you expect him to do? I mean, yes, the system is to be blamed, but then if we've had the president and other government officials say that we also need to fix our attitude and fix ourselves if we're asking for accountability, does this study not reveal that clearly there's a problem with the human attitude and maybe it's time for us to also look within ourselves and fix whatever problem we also have? You know, there's one thing that I always say. When the fish begins to rot, we rot at its head. Mm. If we have a system where we don't have the presidency, for example, being this opaque about acts and perceived instances of corruption, where we do not have such huge sums of money that we expended and unaccounted for, where we have a president who promised to use the Anas principle to fight corruption, and then we find that even when there are these very obvious and palpable acts of corruption is unable to. Look, the whole of this government has literally become totally inept. There's a certain inertia that has <coughs> creeped in, a total inability, in some cases even a certain nonchalance. Look, the Office of Special Prosecutor is the latest in all the gimmicks of government's attempts mm. to fight corruption. The first Special Prosecutor was a man nicknamed Citizen Vigilante by all of us, because of his perceived attempts to unearth corruption, even as a private citizen. What happened when he became special prosecutor? There was all the meandering, there was all the interference, and in almost every key facet of his attempt to work, it was utterly impossible. A few days ago, I had an interesting conversation with some students of mine about what happened to uh, Mr. Kisi Ejabing mm. when he took the matter of uh, the late Sir John's will to court. I mean, look at the ruling. Straight away, if I were in his shoes, what would I do after that? What it tells us is that, look, go there and go and prosecute NDC people. Go and investigate our opponents. You are not put there basically to come in here and uh, t tackle matters to do with our own uh, matters because government probably is giving the impression that they are handling it at their own level. Look, I've also heard stories about how even the late uh, Sir John's wife has been accused and fingers pointed at her for literally, uh, you know, uh, putting that, uh, the contents of the will out there. Look, if you remember the matter to do with the Ajapa uh, proposal, I remember the attacks that were directed at the then Attorney General, Madame Gloria Kufu herself. It tells you government's own posturing when it comes to whatever acts of corruption we speak of, mm. whether perceived, real or other. But you see, when you have so many indexes pointing to the same subject, and all of them on all the key facets, literally putting it in a very succinct manner. I mean, I always say something our parents tell us all the time, that everybody can't be wrong. If you have three, four people saying the same thing, you ought to start to look at it from a very different Was it not similar under uh, the Yeswa Mahama government? Because, oh. I mean, issues of corruption were also right to the extent that even during an international interview, he was asked about it. And, you know, we had him saying, is it me being an individual or a president? Is that what uh, you're looking at? I mean, Bas Branding Saga is clearly one of the examples. And you were in that uh, ministry as a deputy <laughs> when it happened. There was a committee or so that was put together. They found that some amount of money, um, you know, was bloated. So they had to return that money. All of that. So clearly, it means that we've not really worked towards fixing the issue of corruption, not just under this government, but under previous governments as well. But you see, let's put the conversation in proper context. The same reports came out even then under mm. the S. War Mahama administration. I don't recall any of those reports even indicating subtly that okay. it was about over 80% first and foremost. Okay. Secondly, if you recall, there was that long-standing sagas with many of these investigative journalists. Mm. And on each occasion that these reports came out, what did President Mahama do? He was actually seen literally fighting corruption. Okay. And if you remember with the example that you give in particular, especially because I was there at the ministry, mm -hmm. there were the procurement breaches, if you remember. There yeah. was also the issue about the Attorney General, our own Attorney General, 
coming out with a report that even indicated that the uh, whole project cost was too high. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the contractor that was involved paid back half of the uh, amount to government. Mm -hmm. In the past, we've had the issues to do with the Youth Employment Agency. We've had the issues to do with the Public Procurement Authority itself, even the CEO of that agency. We've had the matters to do with the uh, Ameri uh, issue. We've had the matters to do with the Boachia Ajaku case in particular. We've had the matters to do with the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health himself, mm -hmm. regarding how COVID resources were actually utilized. We've had the matter to do even with the, uh, recently, with the ACA issues before Parliament. You know, even recently, with the one billion uh, loan agreement that was put before Parliament, when the budget itself had indicated clearly that what they required was 750 million mm -hmm. and not one billion. So a condition was even placed on it by the minority that required government to actually present its figure that was put in its budget before that request would be acquiesced to. So, uh, you know, look, I would say one thing. It is not, for example, the fact that 87% of our citizens believe that the country is going in the wrong direction. 78% were against the introduction of the e-levy. What happened even? We have heard about all the resources that we received to fight the pandemic. Look, mm. I remember the president telling us very boldly that he couldn't bring back lives, but that he could at least fix the economy. Okay. In the last few weeks, in the last few months, the economy is actually in the doldrums. We all are right. literally at the ICU and begging, literally. And you know, Please land on this corruption is also the in the way we act. What actions persons who are in government, for example, the president, Nana Kufuado, how Vice President Baumia, for example, you, how they tackle these things when they arise, how government agencies led by key individuals, how the IGP, for example, is taking this report. He has time to write a thesis in response to okay. a diplomat who comments on a matter that is within the public purview. So, look, it actually runs across the country. And, okay. you know, for all the beatings that President Akufado dealt the Eswa Mahama administration, wouldn't you at least give some credit that for all that is worth, President Mahama was actually seen Okay. Literally, to be making an Let effort. me bring the others but, in you know, so Bella, they can before I forget, lawyer. today, actually, we are commemorating the 10th anniversary of the passing of late Professor John Evans Atamios, mm. former president of Ghana. Okay. A great man, crowned as J. Heaney, who literally held our inflation rates down for the very longest time. All right. And I believe that today we are all mourning his demise in office, particularly, and asking the good Lord to continue to give his soul sweet repose. Amen. Let me also introduce our third guest on the show quickly before I go to Ellen. And I Janto as the General Secretary of the CPP. Good to have you in the studio. Finally. finally. Yes, finally it's been dear. such a long while. Yes, I hope you're well. Yeah, I'm well, my you're dear. You're well. Yeah. All right. Let me go to Ellen because, I mean, if you listen to lawyer, clearly, even though this report shows that even government appointees are at the bottom, sort of, um, you know, of this index. At the same time, if the fish is rotten, it starts from the head. And so we should hold government accountable for not doing much about the issue of corruption in the country, which is why even younger people were told are even more corrupt than much older people. What do you say? The Ghana Statistical Service, I believe that is a government agency. Shraj, it's a government agency. These are the two who else? I think there's an, a third institution. There's the Ghana Integrity that, Initiative. Well. That is a private. Mm -hmm. um, so there are two government entities involved in this, this study. Mm -hmm. And I find it quite surprising that a uh, lawyer would suddenly place all the corruption in Ghana on top of President Akufuado and Dr. Baumia. They've been in office for six years. This survey tells us that all of us, including you, me, her, Auntie Ya, have the tendencies to be corrupt. Mm. It tells us the situation we find ourselves in, ourselves in as a society. Because when you look at the people whose names are being mentioned, or the highest, um, is it 10 corrupt? Mm. 10 or 15 corrupt, they've listed them, yeah. starting from the police service. People in the police service, most of them are, they are not politicians. Policemen are not politicians. They are Ghanaians who apply and go there and become policemen. And they are being rated as the most corrupt. We've all had incidences and run-ins with police 
when they are collecting your money, they don't care whether you are a politician, you are a doctor, you are a pastor. They don't care. The point is they want to, I mean, they, they are in for the money. Yeah. And I've had instances where I've had to complain, especially even in Accra, they, they are a bit more circumspect about how they take the money. When you get out of Accra, you are going into the hinterland. There was a time between Techiman and Wenchi. I got there with public transport. Early morning, 4 a.m. And you know, the police had come to put a barrier. Mm. And they were collecting five CDs, five CDs from the taxi drivers as early as 4 a.m. That is how bad the police service is. Mm. And I think it's high time some of us look them in the face and tell them that your corruption is not just nice, it is also ugly. When you have to put up a, a, a barricade in, an, in a region mm. and practically collect, it's like dues. And the taxi drivers, as they are approaching the, the, the police barrier, you can see them bringing out whether it is their license or whatever, a booklet, and then they'll be putting the 5 5 CDs. That is how terrible the police And this is something you witnessed? I saw it. Did you escalate this matter? Of course. Matter? I made it. That's about two, three years ago. What happened? I, I heard they stopped, but... <laughs> Maybe they won't take it again at 4 a.m. They will take it at 5 p.m. And I won't be there. So that is, this just brings out the sort of situation we find ourselves. I think politicians are the least of, 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 of the problems now. All of us have our eyes on politicians. All of us. Mm. So the least thing, we all blow it up. So let me tell you, the politicians, we are, well, let me use myself as an example. I, I don't think I am in, I would want to go and take bribe or or give bribe for anybody to record me because I am a target for people who want to find out what's happening. But we forget about the others. We forget about the civil service. We forget about the civil servants. But how much will they take compared to a politician? Which is but, what but that's, that's people, matter, people was saying. That you, matter, we always say the Ghana Peace Service is the most corrupt. That's because you contact them on a daily yeah, basis. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, even yeah, that yeah, amount yeah, that they receive yeah, is yeah. what? One CD, five CD, that's the, against a politician yeah. who takes millions of Ghana CDs of the, at a sitting. It's not a matter of the amount. I feel that it's a matter of the opportunity. Politicians are taken out from our, our society. And we are few at a time. Mm. And it just shows, it just gives us a picture of what we are. And that is what I want us to concentrate on. That all of us have these tendencies and we have to look at it. Right from, maybe from primary school, from our homes, we have to start looking at it because that's where we develop our children. That's where we are getting people to come up into society. Mm. And with this report, I find it sad because it tells us that everybody cares, all that everybody cares about is getting something into my pocket without doing the work. And it's terrible. You're looking at immigration service. I mean, it's gone all the way down to prison service. And the prison service, the question I ask is, what is, what is the bribery in the prison service? How does it go on? We should have, <laughs> we should have, I mean, what is it? Uh, you are, well, you are in prison. Is it the inmates who are bribing the officers? No. Or is it the officers who are... Do you want to wake who are, up this morning? <laughs> prison service of all the places to take bribes. For them to even appear on the radar. So we should look at solving these problems from the bottom, for me. Mm. As for politicians, we are always going to be on the radar. We are always going to have politicians who are corrupt, and we are always going to get them. Well, some might get away with it, but most of the time, it's the politicians that we get. Mm. We should start looking at our systems. You know, before we came up, I was asking you, what about the private um, sector? sector? Yeah. And they, uh, you said it was just 9%. Yes. And the reasons you said they gave was because, one, they didn't have a lot of contact yeah, with mm -hmm. people. And I also believe that, as lawyer said, the private person is interested in his or her profits. So they actually do put in systems that will stop corruption. Mm. Perhaps we should go to them and find out the systems that they are using. And then the other question comes up. Assume we even go for those systems. We would sabotage it ourselves. When you say we, you I'm talk talking about, about the, the institutions. Yes. The institutions. Okay. They'll sabotage the systems. If you remember a few years ago, when uh, I think it was during President Kufo's time, when Papa Kwesi Indum was the minister responsible for public sector some sort reform, of reforms. Reform. And he, was, he introduced this clocking in system, system where you had to clock in when you come to work. What happened to the system? It so, was so, this, so in this I case, mean, who is at fault? Is it I the don't citizen think anybody, or should it be? Because if you put in a system and you ensure that it works, 
the citizens won't have any option Bella, than I don't to obey. At, if you travel this... to all these foreign lands, we can't say that the citizens are not corrupt or would not want to uh, respect the laws. But there's a system that makes sure that if you don't go by the laws, you'll be penalized for it. Do we have that system here? We don't. The exactly. people running the system itself, because you cannot take a politician to go down there and run it. We have to use the civil service. We have to use ourselves. And when you're blaming somebody, I don't think we need to blame, um, particularly blame every, uh, somebody in particular. We have to blame all of us and make up our minds that we want to make it work. Because the, now corruption has a cost to it. It is costing us so much. Mm. It is costing us lives. Because if you have doctors and midwives yes. and nurses who are taking bribes mm -hmm. before they do what they are supposed to do, it means if you don't have the money to pay the bribe, you are dying. Yeah. That is how terrible the situation is. So as we are um, addressing corruption from the top, we should also be looking at addressing it from the bottom. If, per chance, why would you even want to pay the bribe? That's the first thing. Because you want the service. You are in a hurry to get out of the situation you are in. And per the demographics, there's the younger people yeah. who, are, who will want to pay the bribe because, they are, the one, they are not used to this. I mean, it's, it's, can you imagine a policeman has stopped you uh, asking for all the manner of questions they ask? Mm. Let me just give it to him. Let me go. My but way. if I grew up in a system that frowns on corruption, there's no way I would openly want to give the police How my money because I know that the law system? will fight anybody who does that. That's the point. So the younger ones are growing into a system that we're refusing to change, which is why perhaps there are more younger people who are becoming more corrupt and now so because why, the system's already there. Why is that? So for older people, what are we doing? And especially for government officials, so not just this government, but over time, what have we done? Bella, I just think that we need to get our systems running. And the people we put in charge of those systems, do we have to put maybe who, who checks the, the watchman or who watches the watchman? That's something we have to do. How is your government this is doing the, this? This is the police service that is supposed to be, you know, um, guarding against all this. They are top of the list. Mm. So it's a very difficult thing fighting corruptions all the way from the top to the bottom. I believe that is good this, this um, survey has come up. Mm. And as I said, the two institutions mentioned are all government agencies, meaning that government is very interested in what is going on. And government have to find, uh, have to find solutions to it with the support of the citizens. Okay. There's no way any government can work on this without citizens supporting. Okay. Let me bring Nanaya in, and I'll just read a study that was, or a survey that was conducted back in 2014. And this was four years after uh, governments had decided to double the salaries of police officers because constantly they had come up uh, top of the list of most corrupt officials. Now, it says here that researchers demonstrate that raising salaries of corrupt officials can have the consequence of worsening petty corruption in contrast to many cross-country and lab-based studies that have shown that higher salaries or payments reduce corruption. So it says that rather than decrease petty corruption, the salary policy is significantly increased. Um, the salary policy significantly increased the police efforts to collect bribe by some 19%. And the value of bribes taken at each individual stop by between 20 to 28, 25 to 28%. And it increased the total amount taken on the road, even while they reduced the number of times they received bribe. So there have been attempts to address issues of corruption, even in you know, the security institutions. But clearly, this study that was conducted by the University of Wisconsin here in Ghana shows that even when they tried to increase the salaries of police officers, they became even more corrupt. How do we go about this problem then? Thank you, uh, Bella. Um, good morning to everybody. Good morning to uh, my colleagues here, Joyce and Anna. Uh, the issue of corruption is, uh, I, I, I don't know whether it's a canker, it's a sickness, or it's a disease. I, I don't know what it is. Especially with the police. It is so alarming that the people who are supposed to make sure that the writing is done, they are the top of the list. Mm. The immigration, even the immigration one is more scary because talking about all these terrorism issues and the immigration is corrupt, it means that even if they are at the border, some, they will collect money to allow miscreants to enter. Mm. And we are not safe. But we always talk about corruption and leave the matter as it is. We are interested in government, we are interested in the president, we are interested in the minister. As a public servant, somebody who has been in public service for a long time, I always said that, let's look at the public service. Mm. You see, a minister will come to a ministry 
with a very clear mind and conscience to work. The public servant would make sure that the minister becomes corrupt. Because then they would tell you that minister, do it this way, do it that way. Why are you not doing this? So, I mean, for the public service, it is in there. But who gives the bribe? We are always looking at the people who collect. Why are bribes given? Mm. I was elated the way lawyer was talking about the laws. Me, me, I haven't heard about some of the laws. How many people know about the laws? What are the punitive measures available mm. for people who flout these laws? Public Procurement Act, it is flouted every time because of cronism, nepotism. It is not one government. Mm. Let's not put the issue at the doorstep of one government. It has become very, very endemic in our situation right now. I was so surprised to see that even there's corruption in the Savannah region. Even though it's one of the regions that's called the lowest. Yeah, but there's still corruption. Mm. There's still bribery. In the rural areas. But at those days, if you go to the rural areas, people are even prepared to help you. Mm. They are happy to help you. But now in the rural areas, there's corruption. You see, one of the saddest things, even in politics today, if somebody loses an election, the charge is that on massacre, the person is not generous. Not that the person can do the work, home. the person is not generous. You hear it all over the place. So then it means that this issue of money and bribery and corruption, it is now deep in the fabric of our society. Looking through the list, I saw embassy consular officers. Embassy consular officers are not Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. So this one has become a systemic issue that even people who have come from outside, they have been infected by it. So who is giving the bribe? Who is encouraging people to take the bribe? Embassy consular officers, because I need a visa, somebody in the embassy will tell me that go and see this person, or even it's a cartel. Yeah. You you have a direct contact with the consular officer, but so there's a, there are a group of people in the embassy who are doing this. So it becomes very very scary. Embassy consular officer taking a bribe. It does not make sense. And the younger ones, they are prepared to pay bribes. Because of their condition, because of their situation. Most of them are not working. They are prepared to pay money to get a job. They are introduced to somebody in an office. If you pay this amount to me, I will find a job for you. Even this police recruitment, immigration recruitment. It is because the young ones are now vulnerable. If you are starting bringing them up in this manner, the leaders of tomorrow, then when they get there, they're already corrupt. But is it the issue of vulnerability or the fact that for a lot of young people, they don't want to go through, um, you know, the system properly? And so they think that, let me just jump this level because I know someone who knows someone and it will be easy for me. I don't really want to do the work. That is also a factor, is it not? Bella, they think the system has failed them. How Be so? Because they believe that when you finish school, you should be able to do an application to get some employment. And you go through the system and it is given. Mm. I have done it two, three times. I am not getting. My friend who got a third class paid a bribe and has gotten a job. I am not paying and I am still at home. So no matter how straight you are, you don't have a job after university, you will be tempted to pay a bribe. As Alma was saying, a policeman stops you, you are in a hurry. Sometimes for no reason, they stop you. Mm. Then they start asking all manner of questions. You are in a hurry. You will pay. Sit in a trotro and see how they harass the trotro drivers and the taxi drivers. Yes, the amounts that they take compared to what the politician takes, they are different. The politician has access to larger amounts of money. The policeman will do the five cities, ten cities. But it's still the same thing. How do we fix this problem? Because clearly, like lawyer mentioned, there are some laws, but yes. it's not working. Plenty. A lot of them. Because the laws... And you should see the punishments, like she's asking, that yes. are actually prescribed. But they are not the, the, working. The, law, the laws are available, but plenty. not known. 
Do you so get education like, there should be a lot of sensitization and education in the system. Mm. Government should make a conscious effort. They have to resource NCCE to be doing this kind of education in the country. Mm. For people to know that if I do this, if you cross a red light, you know that you've committed an offense. How do you know? Because you've been educated. But I don't know that giving a bribe and taking a bribe is a problem, is a crime. Also, with our system of giving gifts, you know, with the culture that we have, mm -hmm. people give gifts. So the person might think that I'm saying thank you. I am giving you something for you to help me. They don't even know that it's a bribe. So it is time for us to start trying to educate people, the whole nation, bit by bit. Because the way it is going, we might not get the best at the helm of affairs. Mm. It is whoever who can pay more will be at the helm of affairs. The person might be incompetent. The person might be unable. But because the person can pay more, the person will find him or herself in a place that they will not be able to perform. Let me bring in the issue of the police again. And mm -hmm. I remember that when IGP Dampari, before he was officially appointed, uh, there were concerns about the integrity of the police. And a lot of people thought that once he's appointed uh, IGP, he will address that problem. Do you think that he has done that? I like the way lawyers looking at me. How, like, how can he address this problem? <laughs> One person has yeah, IGP. It's not possible. It is not possible. Has he at least attempted? Do you, are you satisfied with work that he has done with regards in, in to this? What work has he done really? Has he really come out to say that the police, we believe there is corruption in the police and these are the measures? What he's doing is more of a combat person dealing with crime and all that. But the internal things about corruption... We should also find out, why is the police doing this? Why are they always, I mean, taking bribes? I remember when I was a young girl, when I finished school, I was going to the police. And I didn't go, I was at the police uh, pier. Mm. One of my friends went. And she said that when she finished the police training school, she was taken to M M MTU, M -M MTU. The first thing when she got there, they gave her a bowl that she should uh, find food for the commander at the place. She said, me, I don't have money. So he, she was just a place. Then somebody to, told her that, look, as part of your training, you have to go and stand under the traffic light. By all means, somebody will cross red. And that's how you make money? Ah, right. Wow. Do you get me? So with, with the police, uh, Dan Paris didn't come out. He hasn't fashioned out any program to say that I'm dealing with bribery. They are even in denial. When you speak about police um, um, bribery and corruption, they are in denial. They will tell you that it is not like that. It is not true. A few of our boys are bad, but not everybody. Most of them say that, why are you focusing on the police when there are other people who are equally corrupt? Because they are top of the list. But the point is that this, 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 this survey done by government... It's government itself. Government it's itself outside. put the police at the top. Because they are always in contact with the civilians. It is, you see, the fact that you are in contact doesn't mean that you should go and collect money. My dear, if I'm always in contact with you, I always come and collect money. The next time you sack me. The fact that you are in contact with them doesn't mean that you should go and collect money. We should not let our laws work. Laws are not working in this country. But, but, we'll have to get back. But, if if but, you are asking me to pay you a hundred Ghana cities mm -hmm. before I can even go through the process to become a police officer mm -hmm. or an immigration officer, mm -hmm. if well, I come, if I make it, then eventually but, but what you should be I would also really collect is, money from people. Remember about the police uh, complaints mm -hmm. unit mm -hmm. in the hotlines that were established. Yes. You ought to find out just what the complaints given why, what they're doing about it, mm -hmm. and how they have actually disciplined persons that mm -hmm. these complaints yes. have been made against. It'd be but a good place to start from. That you should look at. Yeah. You're talking about the laws. Mm -hmm. But who is going to report that? Oh, people report. That people that report. Somebody oh, people has report. taken money oh, from yes, me. yes, people do. Oh, okay, then I agree oh, with you on the complaints. Yes. Mm. Oh, no, no, but report. even that there have been concerns You'll that be when you report, the police still ask you for oh, money yes, before they even file yes. your but report remember that It is almost because of these logistical issues that we even have a Whistleblowers Act, the Right to Information Act and all of that, where we even have to protect the complaint. They're all, all in the oh. freezer. Yeah, that's Every, of this. Just, just, just chilling and as becoming for, king. Let's take a break. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll wrap up on this. Freezer. And we'll also go into the issue of the Ghana card. In fact, I have received a message. It says that I have only 10 days 
to link my Ghana card to my number, otherwise I'll lose my number. Meanwhile, there are people who um, filed for the Ghana card three years ago. They are still fighting to get this card. What happens to such people? We'll come back and talk about it. Mm -hmm.